Hi, I'm Phil Albertelli, and this is The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. I'm going to arbitrarily dub this episode 172. The last two were outside the usual format. One was a Christmas special, a kind of mini-documentary on the bestial Yuletide character, Krampus, and the other was a kind of personal update, so I won't count them among the usual numbered episodes. Before we start, I'd like to quickly thank Trad Shad, hope I'm pronouncing that right, a very nice guy for following the show on Twitter and for liking the Facebook page. And speaking of Twitter, I'd like to thank my good friends across the pond, Russ Ray and the Mad Humanist, for all their retweets. And, uh, see web one at it, too. And the Mad Humanist, by the way, is a fellow podcaster. I really enjoy his show, which is appropriately entitled The Mad Humanist Podcast, so uh, please check that out. And lastly but not least, I'd like to thank Django... Is it Jusk or T Jusk? <laughs> T J O U S K. And a uh, good friend Crocoduck for expressing their concern regarding some recent stuff I've been going through, which I discussed in the last episode. I also had a good talk with friend of the show John Haas and uh, Will Nist as well. But anyway, on with the show. So, circumcision, obviously a fairly controversial topic. And full disclosure, this episode is actually in response to a request from a YouTube viewer. I've somewhat jokingly or self-effacingly mentioned my own adult circumcision on the show a number of times, and the viewer in question wanted me to discuss whether there really is a loss of sensation or difference in sensitivity after the fact. And at first I was thinking, this is a podcast primarily for atheists and agnostics. How am I going to work this into the show? And then it dawned on me that circumcision is a very fitting topic for an atheist podcast. After all, generally speaking, we tend to think of circumcision as a religious practice, not necessarily here in the States where it's primarily practiced for supposed hygienic reasons. And let's face it, conformity, because the parents want their sons to fit in and look like their dad or their peers. And another reason why I think this is a fitting subject for an atheist podcast is because many of us non-believers and hopefully decent civilized people in general are very critical of what I deem the barbaric practice of female circumcision or more accurately female genital mutilation. So I think what I'll do is talk about the history of the practice of circumcision, the role religion plays in it, and also I'll try to artfully, I hope, without getting too graphic, discuss my own anecdotal insights into the difference in sensation when the time is right. I'm going to have a lot of info to sort through, so I guess in an attempt to keep things orderly, I'll go back and forth contrasting or discussing both male circumcision and FGM as I move through the different points of conversation. So first I'll start with the history. Personally, when I think of the origins of circumcision, I tend to think of the ancient Jews and the story of God's covenant with Abraham. And here's Genesis 17.11, as found in the King James Bible. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money, which probably means slave, of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. So probably because I was raised in a Judeo-Christian tradition, I, I was raised Catholic, that's where my mind goes. But apparently, according to multiple sources, the practice of circumcision is up to 15,000 years old. So it stretches back, no pun intended, into prehistory. 
The first thing I thought was, well, if its origins predate recorded history, meaning no written records, how do we know it was actually being practiced? I don't know if maybe ancient stone tools or something like that were discovered. Apparently, this 15,000-year approximation can be traced back to Sir Grafton Elliot Smith. Uh, he was born on August 15th, 1871, in Grafton, New South Wales, but later resided in the uh, United Kingdom. His fields were anatomy, archaeology. His alma mater was uh, the University of Sydney. Uh, he was rewarded with a royal medal in 1912, was a fellow of the Royal Society. So I guess he's got some bona fides, even though... Uh, <laughs> He hasn't been active in uh, any of those fields in quite some time, uh, understandably, since he passed away in 1937. And he uh, was a proponent of something known as the hyperdiffusionist view of prehistory. And I think the hyperdiffusionist view basically posits that certain practices and customs stemmed from one starting point or, or civilization and then spread out. But there's a theory that male circumcision may have started off as a less severe way of marking a conquered enemy or slave. And I think this idea can be traced to a 19th century physician named Peter Charles Romandino, I think it is, who wrote a text entitled History of Circumcision. And when I say less severe, I mean in contrast to castration or the amputation of the penis, also known as a penectomy. And uh, I hope that in between here and the grave, I never have to undergo a uh, penectomy. Um, you know, things like a penectomy or castration may very well have led to the death of the captive. But um, who knows, many quote-unquote primitive uh, cultures practice it as a rite of passage, such as uh, the Australian Aborigines. And if we were to go back into prehistory, I could see it starting that way. And that brings up how there's these two warring opinions, one that suggests the practice developed independently among various cultures or populations, and another that it spread out from one particular culture. And that would be in keeping with the hyperdiffusionist view that I was just touching on a moment ago. And it is very strange um, if it did evolve independently among different cultures, how all these different cultures would somehow come to the conclusion that it's a good idea to amputate uh, an otherwise healthy part of uh, the male anatomy. Uh, very strange. The only thing I can think of is maybe maybe because it's a part that, relatively speaking, you can do without. Uh, you, you can sacrifice that bit of flesh and still survive and function. But still is very odd trying to uh, imagine how people came to the conclusion that that was a, a good idea. I think some people hypothesize that it could have been something that started out for maybe health benefits in certain climes, such as in the Middle East, um, and then took on a, a religious aspect or maybe vice versa. Um, but anyway, before I get too far off track, um, I'm about to go into the history of FGM, but before I do, maybe I should clarify the nature of the procedures before we get too far in. So we all know that male circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin or prepuce. Well, FGM or female circumcision uh, is much more involved, shall we say, and there's actually different typologies that vary in severity. I'll read a bit from Wikipedia, and things are about to get a bit graphic, so if you're squeamish or you're bothered by talk of genitals, you may want to get off the bus right here. Where you take it and uh, so here we go. 
Female genital mutilation, FGM, also known as female genital cutting and female circumcision, is the ritual removal of some or all of the external female genitalia, typically carried out by a traditional circumciser using a blade, with or without anesthesia. FGM is concentrated in 27 African countries, Yemen and Iraqi Kurdistan, and found elsewhere in Asia, the Middle East, and among diaspora communities around the world. It is conducted from days after birth to puberty and beyond. In half the countries for which national figures are available, most girls are cut before the age of five. The procedures differ according to the ethnic group. They include removal of the clitoral hood and clitoral glands. Removal of the... So that's basically the equivalent... That'd be the equivalent of removing or amputating someone's penis. Removal of the inner labia and in the most severe form known as infibulation. Removal of the inner and outer labia and closure of the vulva. In this last procedure, a small hole is left for the passage of urine and menstrual fluid. The vagina is open for intercourse and open further for childbirth. Health effects depend on the procedure, but can include recurrent infections, chronic pain, cysts, and inability to get pregnant, complications during childbirth, and fatal bleeding. There are no known health benefits. The practice is rooted in gender inequality, attempts to control women's sexuality, and ideas about purity, modesty, and aesthetics. It is usually initiated and carried out by women, who see it as a source of honor and fear that failing to have their daughters and granddaughters cut will expose the girls to social exclusion. Over 130 million women and girls have experienced FGM in the 29 countries in which it is concentrated. The United Nations Population Fund estimates that 20% of affected women have been infibulated, a practice found largely in Northeast Africa, particularly Djibouti, Eritrea, Somalia, and Northern Sudan. FGM has been outlawed or restricted in most of the countries in which it occurs, but the laws are poorly enforced. There have been international efforts since the 1970s to persuade practitioners to abandon it, and in 2012, the United Nations General Assembly, recognizing FGM as a human rights violation, voted unanimously to intensify those efforts. All right, and here it gets into the typologies. The WHO, UNICEF, and UNFPA issued a joint statement in April 1997 defining FGM as, and and here it is in quotes, all procedures involving partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs, whether for cultural or other non-therapeutic reasons. The procedures vary considerably according to ethnicity and individual practitioners. During a 1998 survey in Niger, women responded with over 50 different terms when asked what was done to them. But uh, I'll jump forward a bit where it actually gets to the different types. So types 1 through 2, the WHO has created a more detailed typology. And the WHO is, of course, the World Health Organization. Uh, types 1 through 3 based on how much tissue is removed. Type 3 is sewn closed. Type 4 describes symbolic circumcision and miscellaneous procedures. Type 1 is subdivided into... It looks like 1A, removal of the clitoral hood, rarely performed alone. And the more common... 1B, clitoridectomy, the complete or partial removal of the clitoral glands and clitoral hood. And it's describing the method here, and it's pretty disturbing. It says, the clitoris is held between the thumb and index finger, pulled out and amputated with one stroke of a sharp object. Then type 2, excision, is the complete or partial removal of the inner labia with or without removal of the clitoral glands and outer labia. Type 2A is removal of the inner labia. Type 2B, removal of the clitoral glands and inner labia. And and man, I know this is getting uh, pretty graphic. 
type 3 infibulation or pharaonic circumcision. The sewn clothes category involves removal of the external genitalia and fusion of the wound. The inner and or outer labia are cut away with or without removal of the clitoral glands. Type 3A is the removal and closure of the inner labia and 3B the outer labia. The practice is found largely in Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Sudan, though not South Sudan, in Northeast Africa. Estimates of numbers vary according to one in 2008. Over 8 million women in Africa have experienced it, according to UNFPA in 2010. 20% of women with FGM have been infibulated. Then it quotes a midwife who had actually been a part of these practices and uh, she's describing type three and she says elderly women, relatives and friends secure the girl in the lithotomy position. Okay. I'm not even sure what that is. A deep incision is made rapidly on either side from the root of the clitoris to the foreshad, I think it is. And a single cut of the razor excises the clitoris in both the labia majora and labia minora. That's crazy, man. In Somalia, the clitoral glands is removed and shown to the girl's senior female relatives who decide whether enough has been amputated. After this, the labia are removed. A single hole of two to three millimeters is left for the passage of urine and menstrual fluid. By inserting something such as a twig into the wound, the vulva is closed with surgical thread, agave, or acacia thorns, or covered with a poultice such as raw egg, herbs, and sugar. The parts that have been removed might be placed in a pouch for the girl to wear. To help the tissue bond, the girl's legs are tied together, often from hip to ankle. For anything up to six weeks, the bindings are usually loosened after a week and may be removed after two. And it continues with the account of this, uh, or the writings of this midwife. The entrance to the vagina is obliterated by a drum of skin extending across the orifice except for a small hole. Circumstances at the time may vary. The girl may struggle ferociously, in which case the incisions may become uncontrolled and haphazard. The girl may be pinned down so fir firmly that the bones may fracture. If the remaining hole is too large in the view of the girl's family, the procedure is is repeated. The vagina is opened for sexual intercourse or for the first time either by a midwife with a knife or by the woman's husband with his penis. In some areas, including Somaliland, uh, including Somaliland, okay, <clears throat> is that like zombie land? I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, and I know this is a very serious matter. Female relatives of the bride and groom might watch the opening of the vagina to check that the girl is a virgin. Psychologist Hanny Lightfoot Klein interviewed hundreds of women and men in Sudan in the 1980s about sexual intercourse with type 3. The penetration of the bride's infibulation takes anywhere from three to four days to several months. Some men are unable to penetrate their wives at all, and the task is often accomplished by a midwife under conditions of great secrecy, since this reflects negatively on the man's potency. Some who are unable to penetrate their wives manage to get them pregnant in spite of the infibulation, and the woman's vaginal passage is then cut open to allow birth to take place. Those men who do manage to penetrate their wives do so often, or perhaps always, with the help of a little, quote-unquote, little knife. This creates a tear which they gradually rip more and more until the opening is sufficient to admit the penis. And, uh, I know it's getting really graphic, so I'll just move on from reading the gory details any further about uh, those different typologies. So obviously some pretty brutal stuff. Uh, my apologies once again uh, if things got a bit too graphic. I, I believe there are, are actually some cultural relativists who actually attempt to defend the practice. Uh, but I'll get to that later when I discuss the modern view of FGM. Uh, for now, I'll get back to the history. From what I was able to glean, the practice of female circumcision or FGM goes back to at least approximately 2,000 years before the Common Era, and apparently both male and female circumcision were practiced in ancient Egypt, and there's something known as spell 
1117. Yes, I did say spell. It's a kind of magical inscription found on an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus circa 1991 to 1786 BCE. And I'll read the inscription now. But if a man wants to know how to live, he should recite it, a magical spell, every day, after his flesh has been rubbed with the, and there's an Egyptian word here, um, for an unknown substance, of an uncircumcised girl, and the flakes of skin, another Egyptian word, of an uncircumcised bald man. So, uh, very strange. And I'm going to read a little more on the history of the practice from, you guessed it, Wikipedia. The origins of the practice are unknown. Its east-west-north-south distribution in Africa meets in Sudan, leading Jerry Mackey to speculate that infibulation originated with the Merorite civilization and imperial polygyny before the rise of Islam to increase confidence in paternity. And I believe that uh, sarcophagus inscription I read um, dates to the Middle Kingdom. Let's see. And here's uh, more from Wikipedia. The proposed circumcision of an Egyptian girl, Tothemis, I think it is, is mentioned on a Greek papyrus from 163 BCE in the British Museum. Sometime after this, Nephorus, Tethemus's mother, defrauded me, being anxious that it was time for Tethemus to be circumcised, as is the custom among the Egyptians. She asked that I give her 1,300 drachma to clothe her and to provide her with a marriage dowry. If she didn't do each of these, or if she did not circumcise Tethemus in the month of Mekher, I think it is, year 18, 163 BCE, she would repay me 2,400 drachma on the spot. The examination of mummies has shown no evidence of, F- of FGM, citing the Australian pathologist Grafton Elliot Smith, uh, there he is again, who examined hundreds of mummies in the early 20th century. Knight writes that the genital area may resemble type 3 because during mummification, the skin of the outer labia was pulled towards the anus to cover the pudendal cleft. This really is a graphic episode. Possibly to prevent sexual violation. It was similarly not possible to determine whether types 1 or 2 had been performed because soft tissues had been removed by the embalmers or had deteriorated. And here's a bit from the ancient Greek historian, geographer uh, Strabo. This is one of the customs most zealously pursued by them, the Egyptians, to raise every child that is born and to circumcise the males and excise the females. It says um, Strabo wrote that after visiting Egypt around 25 BCE. Then it says the philosopher Philo of Alexandria also made reference to it. The Egyptians, by the custom of their country, circumcised the marriageable youth and maid in the 14th year of their age. So both male and female. When the male begins to get seed and the female to have a menstrual flow, it is mentioned briefly in a work attributed to the Greek physician Galen. When the clitoris sticks out to a great extent in their young women, Egyptians consider it appropriate to cut it out. Once again, where does that idea come from? Another Greek physician, Adius of of Amida, mid-5th to mid-6th century CE, offered more detail in Book 16 of his 16 books on medicine, citing the physician Philomenes. The procedure was performed in case the clitoris, or it looks like nympha, grew too large or triggered sexual desire when rubbing against clothing. On this account, it seemed proper to the Egyptians to remove it before it became greatly enlarged. Adius wrote, especially at the time when the girls were about to be married. The surgery is performed in this way. Have the girl sit on a chair while a muscled young man standing behind her places his arms below the girl's thighs. Have him separate and steady her legs and whole body, standing in front and taking hold of the clitoris with a broad mouth forceps in his left hand. The surgeon stretches it outward. Well, with the right hand, he cuts it off at the point next to the pincers of the forceps. 
It is proper to let a length remain from that cut off about the size of the membrane that's between the nostrils, so as to take away the excess material only. As I have said, the part to be removed is at the point just above the pincers of the forceps. Because the clitoris is a skin-like structure and stretches out excessively, do not cut off too much, as a urinary fistula may result from cutting such large growths too deeply. The genital area was then cleaned with a sponge, frankincense powder, and wine or cold water, and wrapped in linen bandages dipped in vinegar, until the seventh day when calamine, rose petals, and date pits, or a genital powder made from baked clay, might be applied. That continues... Whatever the practice's origins and fibulation became linked to slavery, Mackey cites the Portuguese missionary, and I don't want to butcher that, uh, but his last name is Santos, who in 1609 wrote of a group inland from Mogadishu who had a custom to sew up their females, especially their slaves, being young, to make them unable for conception, which makes these slaves sell dearer, both for their chastity and for better confidence which their masters put in them. The English explorer William Brown wrote in 1799 that the Egyptians practiced excision and that slaves in that country were infibulated to prevent pregnancy. Thus, Mackey argues, a practice associated with shameful female slavery came to stand for honor. And here's some more about the history of male circumcision. The history of the migration and evolution of the practice of circumcision is followed mainly through the cultures and peoples in two separate regions, in the lands south and east of the Mediterranean, starting with Sudan and Ethiopia. The procedure was practiced by the ancient Egyptians and the Semites, and then by the Jews and Muslims, with whom the practice traveled to and was adopted by the Bantu Africans. In Oceania, circumcision is practiced by the Australian Aborigines and Polynesians. There is also evidence that circumcision was practiced among the Aztec and Mayan civilizations in the Americas, but little details available about its history. Evidence suggests that circumcision was practiced in the Arabian Peninsula by the 4th millennium BCE when the Sumerians and the Semites moved into the area that is modern-day Iraq. The earliest historical record of circumcision comes from Egypt in the form of an image of the circumcision of an adult carved into the tomb of Ankh Mahor at Saqqara, dating to about 2400 to 2300 BCE. Circumcision was done by the Egyptians, possibly for hygienic reasons, but also was part of their obsession with purity and was associated with spiritual and intellectual development. No well-accepted theory explains the significance of circumcision to the Egyptians, but appears to have been endowed with great honor and importance as a rite of passage into adulthood. Performed in a public ceremony emphasizing the continuation of family generations and fertility. It may have been a mark of distinction for the elite. The Egyptian Book of the Dead describes the sun god Ra as having circumcised himself. Though secular scholars consider the story to be literary and not historical, circumcision features prominently in the Hebrew Bible. The narrative in Genesis chapter 17, and that would be what I read at the uh, top of the episode, describes the circumcision of Abraham and his relatives and slaves. In the same chapter, Abraham's descendants are commanded to circumcise their sons on the eighth day of life as part of a covenant with God. In addition to proposing that circumcision was taken up by the Israelites purely as religious mandate, scholars have suggested that Judaism's patriarchs and their followers adopted circumcision to make penile hygiene easier in hot, sandy climates. And that's actually uh, what I was saying earlier. Yeah, it's saying that it may have had a dual role. On the one hand, it helped promote penile hygiene. and That's a funny uh, term, penile hygiene. And... Also, it functioned as a rite of passage, uh, as it puts it here, into adulthood or as a form of blood sacrifice. And uh, I'll continue. Oh, here's one of my favorite historical figures, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the Middle East in the 4th century BCE. I think I read the entirety of Arian's campaigns of Alexander while serving jury duty one time. It was actually an attempted murder trial, if uh, I remember correctly. I wasn't reading it while I was supposed to be working as a juror. I think I read the entirety of it the first day while waiting to be called. 
Rein yourself in, digressing, digressing. But anyway, back to Alexander. Alexander the Great conquered the Middle East in the 4th century BCE, and in the following centuries, ancient Greek cultures and values came to the Middle East. The Greeks abhorred circumcision, making life for circumcised Jews living among the Greeks and later the Romans very difficult. Antiochus Epiphanes outlawed circumcision, as did Hadrian, which helped cause the Bar Kokhba revolt. And if you're not familiar with the here I go again, if you're not familiar with the Bar Kokhba revolt or rebellion, this was a little bit after Jesus. Um, obviously, not all Jews were sold on this idea that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, Bar Kokhba was more of the traditional. Jewish Messiah or, or in that image, uh, you know, a, a warrior king like David. Um, but alas, Bar Kokhba too was defeated by the Romans. But anyway, here I go, uh, continuing. During this period in history, Jewish circumcision called for the removal of only a part of the prepuce. And some Hellenized Jews attempted to look uncircumcised by stretching the extent parts of their foreskins. This was considered by the Jewish leaders to be a serious problem. And during the 2nd century CE, they changed the requirements of Jewish circumcision to call for the complete removal of the foreskin, emphasizing the Jewish view of circumcision as intended to be not just the fulfillment of a biblical commandment, but also an essential and permanent mark of membership in a people. All right, I wasn't kidding when I said there was a lot of information to sift through. I'm doing my best to stay organized as I go here. I guess now I'll move on to the role or influence of religion. And uh, obviously, I just touched on this a little bit not long ago. Well, we know circumcision is big among at least two of the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism and Islam. Although I think uh, there may be some Christian sects that practice it, um, such as uh, the Coptic Christians of Egypt. So as was just discussed, the religious importance of circumcision in Judaism can be traced back to Genesis 17, in which Abraham circumcised himself as a symbol of his covenant with God. Uh, the circumcision of the infant male usually takes place on the eighth day after birth, as prescribed in the book of Leviticus. All right. um, the person who conducts or performs the circumcision is known as a moil. And we've probably all heard the term bris, that's the circumcision ceremony. The ritual calls for the drawing of blood from the circumcision wound. Some moils do so by hand or with a suction device. Orthodox Jews, as strange or off-putting as it may seem, often prefer to extract or draw out the blood by mouth. Yes, the moil uses his mouth. Uh, here's a brief passage regarding this method and the risk of disease. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued a warning in 2012 about the health implications of this practice, citing 11 cases of neonatal HSV and two recorded fatalities. A 2013 review of cases of neonatal HSV infections in Israel identified ritual circumcision as the source of HSV-1 transmission in 31.8% of of cases. Yeah, I mean, cultural relativity be damned. You probably don't want an adult man sucking blood from your child's, well, circumcision wound. Okay, so the Wikipedia stubs on Islam and Christianity regarding circumcision are, are uh, really short. So for the sake of brevity and out of sheer laziness, I'll just quickly read those. Although there is some debate within Islam over whether it is a religious requirement, circumcision, also called katan, I think it is, is practiced nearly universally by Muslim males. Islam bases its practice of circumcision on Genesis 17 narrative, on the Genesis 17 narrative, the same biblical chapter referred to by Jews. The procedure is not explicitly mentioned in the Quran. However, it is a tradition established by Islam's prophet Muhammad directly following Abraham, and so its practice is considered a sunnah, prophet's tradition, and is very important in Islam. For Muslims, circumcision is also a matter of cleanliness, purification, and control over one's base or self. 
There is no agreement across the many Islamic communities about the age at which circumcision should be performed. It may be done from soon after birth up to about age 15. Most often is performed at around 6 to 7 years of age. The timing can correspond with the boy's completion of his recitation of the whole Quran, with a coming-of-age event such as taking on the responsibility of daily prayer or betrothal. Circumcision may be celebrated with an associated family or community event. Circumcision is recommended for but is not required of converts to Islam. Can you imagine having to recite an entire holy book? Yeah, you're going to recite the Quran and we're going to amputate part of your penis. Not a day I'd be looking forward to. So here it goes on to talk about Christianity. The New Testament chapter Acts 15 records that Christianity does not require circumcision. Christianity does not forbid it either. The Catholic Church currently maintains a neutral position on the practice of non-religious circumcision and has never addressed the issue of infant circumcision specifically. Coptic Christians practice circumcision as a rite of passage. Yep. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church calls for circumcision, with near universal prevalence among Orthodox men in Ethiopia. In South Africa, some Christian churches disapprove of the practice, while others require it of their members. Yeah, so Acts 15 discusses the conflict going on in the early church over whether it was necessary or not for Gentiles who wish to become Christians to become circumcised. Because obviously Jesus was Jewish, the first uh, Christians were Jewish. Uh, probably at that time we would have referred to it, or historians refer to it as the Jesus movement. So if you wanted to become a Christian, you basically had to become a Jew. And so there was this conflict over whether or not those who wished to become Christians needed to adhere to things like Jewish dietary restrictions and whether or not they needed to be circumcised. And Paul was on the side that um, these things weren't necessary. Uh, Basically, what was necessary is uh, that you were circumcised in your heart, so to speak. And here's uh, Romans 2.29, and this is the King James Bible version. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And I promised I would go back and forth, also discussing FGM along the way. So here's an entry on FGM in religion. And I'm sure I am going to butcher this uh, place name, but... Kher Simbara, Senegal, which abandoned FGM in 1998 after a three-year community program by Tostin. Surveys have shown a widespread belief, particularly in Mali, Mauritania, Guinea, and Egypt, that, that FGM is a religious requirement. It's talking here about how practitioners may not distinguish between religion, tradition, and chastity. Um... And it says, making it difficult to interpret data. As a part of UNFPA, UNICEF's joint program, uh, 20,941 religious and traditional leaders made public declarations between 2008 and 2013, de-linking their religions from the practice, and religious leaders issued 2,898 edicts against it. And this reminds me of that ongoing debate whether or not FGM is an Islamic practice or simply a pre-Islamic practice that was adopted by certain Islamic cultures. And, of course, Reza Aslan, um, someone who's probably infamous to uh, fellow Sam Harris fans out there, uh, who I guess, you know, I actually, I used to really like Reza Aslan. Uh, I read his book, uh, Zealot. Uh, I enjoyed watching him on Real Time with Bill Maher over the years. I actually think, uh, and I watched a, I thought it was quite a good documentary on the History Channel or something about the history of Islam that I think he contributed to. I watched that a while back. But I think he is something of, I guess it's kind of an ugly term maybe, but in... uh, Muslim apologist, and it seems to me that he really goes out of his way to defend Islam. And he's one of these people who has a really airy, fairy 
kind of very elastic approach to religion, that religion itself is never to be blamed. It's up to how a person wants to interpret it. That leads to whether or not, you know, the religion is, is used uh, for good or for evil, to put it in uh, comic book terms. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. That is true that all religions are open to interpretation to some degree, and all religions you know, or, or religious texts contain contradictions. But that being said, um, that shouldn't be a justification for sticking our heads in the sand regarding some of the uglier stuff that's in these religious texts. And of course, as Sam Harris talks about, there are some mitigating differences to with uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition in the Old Testament, we have some very ugly stuff, the Book of Joshua, and of course the late great Christopher Hitchens used to often bring up the slaughter of the Amalekites and the Midianites. You know, all these really lurid instances of genocide and warfare and uh, taking young women as spoils of war and stuff like that. But then, of course, we have the New Testament, which kind of offsets that. And relatively speaking, it takes on kind of a softer tone, with some exceptions. The Book of Revelation, uh, which almost didn't make it into uh, the canonical Bible, is, is a very kind of lurid and strangely violent book. Jesus himself says some kind of eyebrow-raising things. Um... And there's certainly a lot of talk about the gnashing of teeth and separating the wheat from the chaff and all this kind of ominous stuff. But Jesus, for the most part, isn't the traditional warrior messiah. He's this kind of wandering teacher, in a way. And you juxtapose that with Muhammad, who really is a warlord. And I'm not just trying to parrot Sam Harris's talking points. I'm actually, I've actually talked many times on the show before about how if you name a religion, I can tell you things that I like about it and things that I don't like about it. And, uh, you know, being generous, even if I don't like some of the more violent and destructive tenets of religion, you know, why would I? I can still find worth in, in some of the more ostentatious trappings of the religion, maybe, the art and architecture, the sacred music, and stuff like that. And Islam's no different. There's, I mean, one of my favorite poets is Rumi, the, the famous Sufi poet. Um, I actually like a lot of Arabic and Middle Eastern music. Uh, I could go into the preservation and translation of, the, of classical texts, um, by Islamic scholars, uh, you know, during the Middle Ages and things like that, and uh, their exploration of certain scientific fields like um, the science of light and optics, and of course, uh, arithmetic and whatnot. Um, what the hell am I talking about? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm straddling the fence here as usual. <laughs> Try not to look like an Islamophobe, but try not to look too soft at the same time. But yeah, but I mean, I'm just being honest. Uh, yeah, pretty much you name a religion, I can tell you things I like about it, things I don't like about it. Oh yeah, man, do I tend to digress. So we're talking about circumcision in Islam, or rather female genital mutilation in Islam. So I would say, I mean, obviously FGM predates Islam. We've already established that. But even if it isn't solely Islamic, I imagine that line becomes blurred and when you have Muslims practicing it and attaching these ideas of spiritual purity to it, um, then in, in a sense it does become a Muslim practice. But yeah, I, I know what I was talking about Reza Aslan. How even though there's some things I like about Reza Aslan, I, I think he can be very intellectually dishonest. He does take this elastic, airy-fairy approach to religion and... Uh, I guess in YouTube vernacular, we'd say he's kind of a white knight for for uh, Islam, <laughs> even if it means tying himself into uh, cognitive pretzels to try to uh, defend the faith. I think he's one of these people who tries to, to say, no, it's not an Islamic practice. It, it's um, 
practiced by all different religions. It predates Islam. I'd say, well, he's kind of, he's right and wrong. It does predate Islam, but it's mostly at this point in time in Islamic practice. But anyway, let's see where this goes. I'll continue uh, reading. Although FGM's origins in northeastern Africa are pre-Islamic, the practice became associated with Islam because of that religion's focus on female chastity and seclusion. There is no mention of it in the Quran. It is praised in several hadith, sayings attributed to Muhammad, as noble but not required, or advises to refrain from it, as it is painful to a woman. In 2007, the Al-Azhar Supreme Council of Islamic Research in Cairo ruled that FGM had no, and here's quotes, no basis in core Islamic law or any of its partial provisions. FGM is also practiced by animist groups, particularly in Guinea and Mali, and by Christians. In Niger, for example, 55% of Christian women and girls have experienced FGM, compared with 2% of their Muslim counterparts. There is no mention of FGM in the Bible, and Christian missionaries in Africa were among the first to object to it. The only Jewish group known to have practiced it are the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, Judaism requires male circumcision, but does not allow FGM. Okay, so now I think I'll jump to recent history and discuss how circumcision for non-religious reasons came to be prevalent in the States. So it wasn't until uh, the 19th century that circumcision in the West for non-religious reasons really became popular. And this has to do with some quack medical ideas that were popular at the time. I don't know if it was born of some puritanical mindset or what, but there was this idea among American and British doctors that masturbation was responsible for a whole host of physical and mental ailments, everything from epilepsy, tuberculosis, STDs, and even madness. So in an attempt to nip these disorders off at the bud, no pun intended, uh, doctors began widely recommending circumcision because it was thought circumcision would deter masturbation. Maybe the thinking was circumcision would lessen the sex drive or dull sensation and thus uh, curbing the temptation to masturbate. I'm not sure, and I will discuss circumcision and possible adverse sexual effects in a bit. But here's some more from, uh, you guessed it, Wikipedia. English physician Jonathan Hutchinson published his findings that Jews had a lower prevalence of certain venereal diseases while pursuing a a successful career as a general practitioner, Hutchinson went on to advocate circumcision for health reasons for the next 50 years and eventually earned a knighthood for his overall contribution to medicine. In America, one of the first modern physicians to advocate the procedure was Louis Sayre, it looks like, a founder of the American Medical Association. In 1870, Sayre began using circumcision as a purported cure for several cases of young boys presenting with paralysis or significant motor problems. He thought the procedure ameliorated such problems based on a reflex neuroses theory of disease, which held that excessive stimulation of the genitals was a disturbance to the equilibrium of the nervous system and a cause of systemic problems. The use of circumcision to promote good health also fit in with the germ theory of disease, which saw validation during the same time period. The foreskin was seen as harboring infection-causing smegma. <clears throat> a mixture of shed skin cells and oils. Serre published works on the subject and promoted it energetically in speeches. Contemporary physicians picked up on Serre's new treatment, which they believed could prevent or cure a wide-ranging array of medical problems and social ills. Its popularity spread with publications such as Peter Charles Romandino's History of Circumcision, by the turn of the century in both America and Great Britain, infant circumcision was nearly universally recommended. After the end of World War II, Britain moved to a nationalized health care system and so looked to ensure that each medical procedure covered by the new system was cost-effective. Douglas Gardner's 1949 article, The Fate of the Foreskin, argued persuasively that the evidence available at the time showed that the risks outweighed the known benefits and circumcision rates dropped in Britain and in the rest of Europe. 
In the 1970s, national medical associations in Australia and Canada issued recommendations against routine infant circumcision, leading to drops in the rates of both those countries. In the United States, the American Academy of Pediatrics has, over the decades, issued a series of policy statements regarding circumcision, sometimes positive and sometimes negative. An association between circumcision and reduced heterosexual HIV infection rates was suggested in 1986. Experimental evidence was needed to establish a causal relationship, so three randomized controlled trials were commissioned as a means to reduce the effect of any confounding factors. Trials took place in South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda. All three trials were stopped early by their monitoring boards on ethical grounds because those in the circumcised group had a lower rate of HIV contraction than the control group. Subsequently, the World Health Organization promoted circumcision in high-risk populations as part of an overall program to reduce the spread of HIV. Although some have challenged the validity of the African randomized controlled trials, prompting a number of researchers to question the effectiveness of circumcision as an HIV prevention strategy, the Male Circumcision Clearinghouse website was formed in 2009 by the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, FHI, and AVAC to provide current evidence-based guidance. Information and resources to support the delivery of safe male circumcision services in countries that chose to scale up the procedure as one component of comprehensive HIV prevention services. And I noticed while reading the article the conspicuous absence of any mention of the infamous Dr. Kellogg. Um, yes, the uh, cornflake guy. So John Harvey Kellogg, born in uh, 1852, was an American physician, and uh, I wasn't kidding, the inventor of cornflakes, originally named uh, Granula, uh, Count Granula, uh, which then became Granola, and then cornflakes again. But yeah, I mean, joking aside, this guy's views on sexuality were, were really kind of disturbing, especially when you consider the influence he had. And uh, I'll read from uh, Wikipedia again regarding his views on sexuality. As an advocate of sexual abstinence, Kellogg devoted large amounts of his educational and medical work to discouraging sexual activity on the basis of dangers both scientifically understood at the time, as in sexually transmissible diseases and those taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Same church uh, Ben Carson belongs to. He set out his views on such matters in one of his larger books, published in various editions around the start of the 20th century, under the title Plain Facts About Sexual Life and later Plain Facts for Old and Young. Some of his work on diet was influenced by his belief that a plain and healthy diet with only two meals a day, among other things, would reduce sexual feelings. It's so bizarre. Why do you want to reduce sexual feelings? Those experiencing temptation were to avoid stimulating food and drinks and eat very little meat, if any. Kellogg also advocated hydrotherapy and stressed the importance of keeping the colon clean through yogurt enemas. Oh boy. He warned that many types of sexual activity, including many excesses, <laughs> In quotes, that couples could be guilty of within marriage were against nature and therefore extremely uh, unhealthy. It says that uh, it suggested that he worked on his book Plain Facts during his honeymoon. He was an especially zealous campaigner against masturbation. This was an orthodox view during his lifetime, especially the earlier part. Kellogg was able to draw upon many medical sources claims such as neither the plague nor war nor smallpox nor similar diseases have produced results so disastrous to humanity as the pernicious habit of Onanism. And there's a reference to the Bible, the story of uh, Onan. And I think it, Onan's sin wasn't actually masturbating, if I remember correctly. It was that, um, so I believe Onan's brother died. And he had some kind of duty to impregnate his uh, sister-in-law on his brother's behalf, so to speak. And instead of impregnating her, he spilled and wasted his seed. So I think his crime actually was that he kind of shirked his duty and uh, wasted the th and wasted the seed intentionally that was meant to, you know, give his sister-in-law a child. It wasn't masturbation in general. Um, 
says uh, do, 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 Kellogg strongly warned against the habit in his own words, claiming of masturbation related deaths. Such a victim literally dies by his own hand. Unbelievable. I uh, thought that masturbation destroyed not only physical and mental health, but the moral health of the individual as well. He believed that it caused cancer of the womb, urinary diseases, nocturnal emissions, impotence, epilepsy, insanity, and mental and physical debility. Dimness of vision was only briefly mentioned. Nothing about hair on the palms. It says, uh, Kellogg worked on the rehabilitation of masturbators, often employing extreme measures, even mutilation on both sexes. He was an advocate of circumcising young boys to curb masturbation and applying phenol to young women's clitoris. And here's some quotes from his book or one of his books. A remedy which is almost always successful in small boys is circumcision, especially when there is any degree of phimosis. The operation should be performed by a surgeon without without administering an anesthetic. Oh, then for preventing masturbation. And we have employed it with entire satisfaction. It consists in the application of one or more silver sutures in such a way to prevent erection. Jesus. The prepuce of foreskin is drawn forward over the glands, and the needle to which the wire is attached is passed through from one side to the other after drawing the wire through. The ends are twisted together and cut off close. It is now impossible for an erection to occur, and the slight irritation thus produce acts as a most powerful means to overcoming the disposition to resort to the, to the practice. And then um, here it continues, in, in females, the author has found the application of pure carbolic acid to the clitoris an excellent means of allaying the abnormal excitement. He also recommended to prevent children uh, from the quote-unquote solitary vice bandaging or tying their hands, covering their genitals with patented cages, an electric shock, uh, an electrical shock. In his Ladies' Guide in Health and Disease for Nymphomania, he recommended cool sits baths, the cool enema, a spare diet, the application of blisters and other irritants to the sensitive parts of the sexual organs, the removal of the clitoris in nymphi. It says that he thought masturbation was the worst evil one could commit. He was the leader of an anti-masturbation movement. That's quite the legacy. Kellogg thought that diet played a huge role in masturbation and that a bland diet would decrease excitability and prevent masturbation. Thus, Kellogg invented cornflakes breakfast, breakfast cereal in 1878. He hoped that feeding children this plain cereal every morning would help to combat the urges of self-abuse. Now I'm going to read a bit about FGM in the U.S. and Europe in the 19th century uh, for the same kind of quack medical reasons. And it says, uh, Gynecologists in 19th century Europe and the United States removed the clitoris to treat insanity and masturbation. British doctor Robert Thomas suggested clitoridectomy as a cure for nymphomania in 1813. The first reported clitoridectomy in the West, described in the Lancet in 1825, was performed in 1822 in Berlin by Carl Ferdinand von Graef, or I don't know how that's pronounced, on a 15-year-old girl who was masturbating excessively. And once again, it, I mean, it, it really is puritanical. I, I mean, if a teenager is masturbating excessively, who cares? And my guess is it's not like they were masturbating at the dining room table. Uh, you know what I mean? They're probably just young, horny people pleasuring themselves. I don't know what, maybe a few times a day. I don't know what excessive is uh, by Victorian standards. Uh, let them knock themselves out. They'll eventually fall asleep. I mean, life is tough enough as it is. Is there really anything wrong with trying to find some joy in sexual pleasure? Removing parts of people's anatomy because, God forbid, they were seeking some pleasure and not harming anyone else. It's crazy. Weren't touching anyone else, just themselves. All right. And continues, Isaac Baker Brown, an English gynecologist, president of the Medical Society of London and co-founder in 
and co-founder in 1845 of St. Mary's Hospital in London, believed that masturbation or unnatural irritation of the, of the clitoris caused peripheral excitement of the pubic nerve, which led to hysteria, spinal irritation, fits, idiocy, mania, and death. He therefore set to work to remove the clitoris whenever he had the opportunity of doing so, according to his obituary in the Medical Times and Gazette in 1873. Brown performed several clitoridectomies between 1859 and 1866. When he published his views on the curability of certain forms of insanity, epilepsy, catalepsy, and hysteria in females in 1866, doctors in London accused him of quackery and expelled him from the obstetrical society. Good. In the United States, J. Marion Sims followed Brown's work and in 1862 slit the neck of a woman's uterus and amputated her clitoris. And in quotes, for the relief of the nervous or hysterical condition is recommended by Baker Brown. After the patient complained of menstrual pain, convulsions, and bladder problems, um, let's see... Later that century, A.J. Block, a surgeon in New Orleans, removed the clitoris of a two-year-old girl who was reportedly masturbating. According to a 1985 paper in the Obstetrical and Gynecological Survey, clitoridectomy was performed in the U.S. into the 1960s to treat hysteria, erotomania, and lesbianism. And there's another puritanical word, erotomania. What's erotomania? Someone who's maybe preoccupied with sex, who enjoys sex, there's worse things, um, and lesbianism. And of course, that seems grossly barbaric to us, as it should, in this age where we're finally really beginning to see you know, a big sea change in favor of LGBT rights. You know, looking back, thinking of uh, clitoridectomies being performed on people simply because they're attracted to the same sex. It's insane. It's grotesque. So now I think I'll move on to what everyone's been waiting for, the effect or lack thereof of circumcision on things like libido, sensation, and sexual functioning. So this is what Wikipedia has to say. Uh, Circumcision does not appear to decrease the sensitivity of the penis, harm sexual function, or reduce sexual satisfaction. I think one of the sources for this may have been um, Psychology Today, and I was reading the article earlier. Psychology Today has an article called Does Circumcision Reduce Men's Sexual Sensitivity? The best evidence shows that circumcision doesn't impair men's sexual function, but I'll continue with uh, Wikipedia here. Yeah, so circumcision does not appear to decrease the sensitivity of the penis, harm sexual function, or reduce sexual satisfaction. A 2013 systemic review and meta-analysis found that circumcision did not appear to adversely affect sexual desire, pain with intercourse, premature ejaculation, time to ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, or difficulties with orgasm. I'm reading so fast, I, I feel like I'm rattling off one of those laundry lists of potential side effects that you see in drug commercials. Another 2013 systemic review found that the highest quality studies reported no adverse effects of circumcision on sexual function, sensitivity, sensation, or satisfaction. A 2014 literature review found that there are significant gaps in the current literature on male and female sexual health that needs to be addressed for the literature to be applicable to North, to North American populations. And I was reading about how one of the main reasons people thought circumcision might affect male sexual pleasure is because the foreskin is supposedly rich in nerves. And I can attest uh, to that. As a little kid, I once uh, got mine caught in a zipper. Uh, not fun. But apparently the studies are saying, nevertheless, the lack of a foreskin doesn't seem to affect uh, sexual pleasure or uh, sexual functioning. One thing I don't hear the mention of, though, is uh, the role of the glands itself. The glands is basically a raw organ that's protected by the prepuce or foreskin. And I can remember before my own adult circumcision, mine was extremely sensitive to the point where intercourse was so intense at times that the pleasure almost bordered on pain. That kind of sounds like Hellraiser, like... Uh, blurring the line between uh, pleasure and pain. But anyway, uh, yeah, so when you're circumcised, the glands is left completely bare, and it, and it kind of 
as I think the doctor explained it to me, toughens it up or, or becomes desensitized a bit. So just in my own personal experience, it seems like the Force can serve two roles. On the one hand, it sheathed the glands, uh, protecting the sensitivity, and it added a kind of additional aspect of sensation, because almost as if it was mimicking intercourse, uh, the sheath or prepuce itself would move back and forth over the glands. And I know this is kind of TMI. But in fairness, I guess the level of sensitivity might also depend on how far the specific individual's foreskin naturally retracts while aroused. You know, in some cases, it, for some individuals, it retracts all the way. For other people, uh, it barely retracts at all unless manually, manually retracted. Um, I fell into the latter camp. So my glands probably had more of its sensitivity I- intact or had this kind of hypersensitivity about it. I mean, if your glands is exposed whenever you're popping a boner, um, forgive my vulgarity, uh, you know, rubbing against your pants or whatever, it's not going to be as hypersensitive as that of someone whose glands hardly ever sees the light of day. Uh, I feel very self-conscious with all this penis talk. I hope I haven't wandered too far into uh, off-putting territory. If you're still with me, I'll talk about what led me to have an elective circumcision as a young adult. I was somewhere around 19 or 20 at the time, and I've talked about this on the show before, so I apologize if you're a regular listener and uh, all this sounds a bit tedious or painfully familiar. So I was born into a kind of old-school Catholic household where there wasn't a lot of talk about sex or anything like that. So I had no idea what circumcision was or why I looked different than other kids. I can remember being about elementary uh, school age and tagging along with the older kids in the neighborhood. I was a shy little kid, and I remember one time the older kids were in an above-ground swimming pool doing flips in the water uh, while flashing each other. Why? I don't know. Probably because they were just stupid kids. And I was standing outside the pool. Uh, They started goading me to flash as well, and eventually I gave in and reluctantly did so. And uh, with a kind of surprised mirth, they all started kind of teasing me for looking different. Although, in fairness, from what I can remember, the teasing was fairly good-natured, nothing too mean-spirited. I think they uh, compared it to an elephant trunk or something like that. I remember a couple of years later, one of them asked me um, if my thing or the end of my thing still looked like an elephant trunk. And I was like, no. The other kid acted surprised or incredulous by insisted, uh, no, I, I didn't have that anymore. As if my foreskin had magically vanished or fallen off on its own. And all of this might sound kind of silly, but it definitely did a number on my psyche and my self-esteem. I literally thought I was deformed. I remember uh, taking sex ed in middle school, and, and I think even the diagrams and the handouts depicted the penis without a foreskin. So it wasn't until I approached my parents one day, unaware that one of my older brothers was listening at the top of the stairs, and I couldn't take it anymore. So I asked, uh, you know, I said, Mom, Dad, am I deformed? And, and they were completely perplexed. They were like, what? And I asked, you know, why does my penis look different than everyone else's? And finally, they went into a whole spiel about how there's two different types of penises, circumcised and uncircumcised. And this revelation of sorts that indeed I wasn't deformed definitely did bring me some relief. But in a way, it was still kind of too little too late. I still felt like a freak because I knew that supposedly the majority of males, at least at uh, the time here in the States, were circumcised. And and I was also becoming aware that girls seem to prefer the cut look, shall we say. Um, And I can remember during my first sexual experiences in that kind of late middle school, early high school range, I used to try to hide the fact that I was uncut. Um, I would try to deftly stare the hands of whatever girl I happened to be with away from the bell end. Uh, Is that the correct terminology? TMI. And even my first real serious girlfriends, you know, kind of near the end of high school, right after high school, I always had to work up my courage and and I, I would have this kind of heartfelt confession moment where I told them I was uncircumcised. And usually the response was kind of, yeah, so... 
and uh, proof that I was, you know, probably just being way too neurotic. Anyway, I finally said, screw it. And I went to a doctor at a nearby reputable clinic and arranged to be circumcised. Um, the doctor was really cool and came up with some kind of pretend diagnosis that would allow it to be covered by insurance. I don't really recall any pain, but you know, the way surgeries go, you usually are so out of it due to the lasting effects or the lingering effects of the anesthesia and post-operative confusion that you, you're really not fully aware of the pain right away. Even after the fact, though, I don't really recall much pain. I remember waking up with a bandage around the end of my penis and there was some kind of strange medicine-y smell and I had to put some kind of ointment on the stitches. The morning after the surgery, I woke up with, well, you know, um, what guys tend to wake up with, a raging morning erection, and I actually popped a stitch. In a panic, I called the hospital or clinic. It was a Saturday, but someone was still available. I don't know if they were a nurse or what, but um, basically the woman on the phone was like, it's only one stitch, right? Well, as long as all the others are still intact, uh, don't worry about it. Well, everything turned out all right, I think. But in conclusion, I think uh, most of us would probably agree that FGM is cruel and unnecessary, uh, as far as male circumcision goes, personally, if I could go back in time, I'm not sure if I would do it again. To be brutally honest, the main reason I had it done was because I felt self-conscious. I'm now at the point in my life where I care significantly less what other people think. I mean, we all care what people think to some degree, but I no longer care what people think enough that I would lop off a uh, part of my body. I'm comfortable enough in my own skin, uh, no pun intended. Um, you know, that I probably wouldn't uh, do it again. But conversely, all, although I do think there is some difference in sensation, I don't think it's necessarily drastic enough to make me lament being circumcised. And uh, if you're a parent out there and you're wondering if you should have your kids circumcised or not, I can't answer that for you. Uh, that's between you, your spouse, your doctor, and your conscience. Uh, so supposedly circumcision can reduce the risk of some serious STDs, including HIV, as we discussed earlier, uh, which is you know, why it's so um, strongly recommended in, uh, in Africa, where there's still a huge AIDS epidemic. Uh, but we don't live in a third world country here. You know, in the West, there might still be some health benefits, but I don't know if they're enough to merit amputating a part of uh, the male anatomy, especially if you practice uh, good hygiene. But this has been a really long episode, and I am exhausted. So you guys know the drill, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, you can review the show on iTunes, subscribe through iTunes. If you want to support the show monetarily, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the week in doubt. And I'll leave you with this corny old joke. How do you circumcise a whale? Send down four skin divers. All right, later and until next week. Music